Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this panel session. My name is Gagi Karutsunyan. I'm from Armenia. I'm an international relations specialist, youth worker, climate activist, and also part of Impact Team 2050. Uh, I'm very happy to be on this stage with these amazing speakers. And we are going to talk about a very interesting topic about educational technologies, about the future of educational technologies and how it's going to be more accessible and inclusive. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, the evolution of education technologies in the future. So let me introduce our, our amazing speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, his Excellency Dr. Abdul Latif Al Shamsi, former president and CEO higher colleagues of technology and founder of Metaversity. Uh, please welcome. Our second speaker is Raman Talwar. Uh, he was going to join us online. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it offline. Um, he is CEO and founding director Simulanis from India. I hope he can hear us clapping. <laughs> um, Timur Bergaliev, CEO of Biotronics Lab, head of the Laboratory of Applied Cyber, uh, Cybernetics System. Uh, please welcome. Uh, Magjan Kistaubayev, R&D Director, STEM Academia. And also, uh, we have one more speaker from Turkey, Erkan Altuk Yilmaz, a gamification expert. Please welcome. Okay, perfect. So let's start. <laughs> uh, uh, Your Excellency, I'm honored to welcome you at Global Impact Conference, uh, named as one of the most influential Arabs of both 2021 and 2022 by the Arabian Business, ranked as one of the top presidents of Global Executive of the Year. You are the face of educational leadership that the world is striving for right now. Please tell us more about your initiative, the Metaversity that, as you once said, I'm citing, will allow our imaginations lead the way to design environments that are unique and custom built for individual learning experience. Please tell us more about Metaversity. <clears throat> Thank you, Gaki. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-mursaleen. Good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to extend my sincere thanks to GIC for inviting me and to be part of this group, elite group, talking about the future of education and how exciting to talk about the future of education. Um, I'm from the United Arab Emirates. I came from Dubai, where is the maximum temperature in the winter. It's about 20 degrees, but coming here with minus 11, showing you how human can survive that change of a temperature in a very short time. So um, I have a little presentation to you. I want to talk about how do we move from university to metaversity? It's a, it's a concept that we have learned a lot during the COVID-19 and the impact that made on us to do a transformation of education from face-to-face -to, -face to online in a very short period of time. We have learned so much from that experience, but also on the other hand, it has challenged us and we have seen a lot of gaps and that's why I start with a slide saying that I called it the Great Reset. It's not economically, but it's a, it's a reset button for all universities in the world to rethink education. The advantages of many academic institutions that has because of the legacy, the experience, the hundreds of years history, it is no longer applicable with the Gen Z. Why? because the way we deliver education today to our youth is very different. It has to be different. We cannot teach our kids the way we were taught. We have to bring technology more alive and more engaging and more exciting for our students to be on board, to be more engaged. So it's time to move from university to metaversity. It's a reset button. It's an open to all institutions and to learn from what we had. But many of you will say that, well, technology has been there even prior COVID-19. We used MOOCs, we used blended learning, flipped classroom, so it was part of it. So what difference did it make? But when the transition happened, 
And during COVID-19, it has accelerated many of those technology to be implemented immediately so we don't discontinue education. And we were so excited about it. Many countries brag that education did not discontinue. But wait a second, there was a lot of gaps. Do we seriously believe that our kids have learned 100% during COVID-19, during the online? Of course not, we've seen it. Maybe it's, yes, it did not discontinue education, but maybe it's about 50 to 60%, I would say, they have gained from the learning experience. But there was a lot of gaps. It have accelerated many of the technology implementation. It had made our faculty and teachers more experienced in using the technology because when you teach through online, it's different than when you teach face-to-face. -face. You have to engage with the students. How do you engage them? With face-to-face -face communication, you see the eyes of the students who are looking at you, they are paying attention. Well, online through a 2D screen, you don't know what's happening on the other side. You don't know how much of the students are really benefiting or learning from what you are saying. So you have to use different pedagogical tools educationally to be able. And we've seen our faculty have significantly improved, but it's still there was a gap. Now with the COVID-19 is over, students back to school, we thought, oh, look how students are excited to go back to learning. No, they are going back to see their friends more than learning. And this is why it's time where we need to think post-COVID-19 into more of a hybrid, hybrid learning model where we bring our students, yes, on a campus because this is the human face-to-face -face is important, but how do you maintain that engagement through online with more efficient and more ac active? And that make us really rethink, do we need our campuses and schools 70, 80% made of physical classrooms where we know today we can deliver a good quality education, maybe online and more better, of course, through the metaverse. So that gives a lot of uh, thinking and questions to be addressed for the post COVID-19. Well, what is metaverse? What's different from online? We've seen online have caused fatigue. We call it Zoom fatigue. A 2D screen is very boring to sit and listen. Well, Metaverse gives you a headset. It's a virtual 3D. It can, you have, the, the, it, it challenges the human imagination. It becomes more creativity because you, are, you live in a virtual world where you can deliver things in a more interactive way and more engaging. From every learner point of view and We've seen how NFT, for example, it's becoming an, um, an, an interest of many generation, of this ge young generation, because it's unique. It maintains the, uh, the, 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 um, the originality of that, of that work. And it's more important about interaction. And one thing we've seen from the online through the metaverse, metaverse allows socialize among students because they're more acting as an avatars in that metaverse world. And they can sit together and talk, not necessarily in education, in classroom, but together chatting aside and having that kind of social engagement. So let's build the dream campus. Campuses, to build it, it requires physical space, money, budget, finance, time. But with the dream campus, you imagine the best learning environment and you just design it and build it for both for the learners as students and for teachers and faculty. So moving from a traditional university to a metaversity, it allows you to create all those graphics and that is more lab, lab simulations, more of a meta class. And what will happen to our existing campus? It become more of an open lab space for students to come there, have a cup of coffee, chat with their peers, about a project, about an entrepreneurial idea that they want to promote, about going, talking to their uh, faculty for uh, how to build a prototype, for example. So it's become more of an open lab space rather than a traditional education. This is why it becomes more exciting for this youth. Now, definitely it provokes, it inspires students, and it synthesizes ideas. And this is more exciting for the Gen Z. It's, it's more receptive to the learners. We've seen the Gen Z, how the excitement happens when, they, when something has to do with the technology and they, how happy they are with it. 
And it's, uh, it's again, it's a present representation of an avatar for both, for the learner and for uh, the teachers as well. And it's a social experience. So it's bring everything together into this metaverse world that it can really bring learners to a different level and ensure that the students are learning. We will hear from the other speakers later on about how do we bring games into a learning, how do we bring simulation into a, into a learning environment that makes it more exciting. So one thing I want to throw here extra is that why not at some point we have an NFT meta class? What do I mean by that? Today you can design your contents, create it, and have it on a Web3, and you have the ownership of this material to be available on a Web3 where students can log in and they can engage with those classes. But what's important, the contribution of all the stakeholders, whether as a teacher, faculty, or even students, is counted. And it is already recognized in the Web3. And this is the advantage of having uh, a cryptography on a blockchain, where it is the ownership of every contribution is maintained. And this is what will bring the value of NFT meta class higher based on the review of a students. If students are really excited about that class and they're learning a lot about it, they will have a higher review. It will bring the value is higher. So imagine our faculty, our teachers in the future, they will become more like a movie stars rather than a traditional teachers who are, you know, like or a boring teacher that nobody want to go to their class. Everybody will go into that class because that teachers, yeah, they have more interactive sessions and more engagement. And that will build the micro-credential concept. So it's a more of a, it become more of a platform where the contribution of many of the leading organizations from OCD City, for example, Coursera, and many of those who offer online courses that can have a part in that metaversity where students can access it. And then with those micro-credentials, it will add up to a bigger cred uh, credential or a degree as the time they graduate. So a metaversity, it's like a mall-like campus. Our kids, they are so excited when they want to go to a mall. It's so much fun, so much excitement. But when you tell them to go to school, they kind of switched off. They want to have a break. They want to have a vacation. And the reason is that because our school model is still boring. And there's no engagement. There's no social interaction. It's a one-way communication from a teacher to the poor student. So imagine this generation especially, and we've heard, we heard it before, how boring is it for them to go to and to listen to students? So, Let's have a campus that's more of a more light campus. I don't need to go to school to attend a class. I can go to school to have a cup of coffee with my friends, to chat with them, maybe to go to a movie, or enjoy the time that I want to spend on that campus instead of going to a mall. But the advantage, I will have the same peers of my age in that campus. I will be able to meet with my faculty, my teachers, if I have something to talk about. So it brings, it's, a, it's an element of the three things. And this is why I have to bring your attention that the metaversity is not only a virtual, it's also a, an on-campus component is an essential component. It's an essential component. So it's a made of this, the metaverse, the on-campus, and of course, the social entertainment part that makes that ecosystem a complete uh, like excitement for the generation z so i don't want to make it long but in summary let's imagine that you walk in an ideal campus where the environment is designed to excite learners to cater for their needs bring their appetites about learning let's imagine it's a venue to collaborate connect with the friends meet and socialize let's imagine a campus around the notion that inspire, provoke those ideas. And let's talk about those ideas and let's make it happen because we believe the Generation Z are very smart kids. They have all these great, wonderful ideas. Let's bring it to that campus. Let's imagine a campus that provides all these opportunities to culture and raise the boundaries and fuel uh, collaboration. So welcome to the metaversity where ambitious meets fruitations, imagination meets creation, and learning comes to life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for the presentation. Uh, I completely agree with all the points that you've mentioned that we need to change the educational system into more interactive. So thank you so much for that. And let's move to our next speaker, uh, uh, Erkan, Erkan Altuk Yilmaz, gamification expert from Turkey. 
Um, in recent years, the concept of ad tech has transformed completely, with gamification being one of the key trends driving the industry development. It's more than a buzzword now. Experts project, project that by 2025, the global gamification market will reach 30.7 billion US dollars, with the estimate of increasing company productivity by up to 50% and employee engagement by 60%. Mr. Ilmas, you are a true expert in the field. Uh, what is the difference between good game-based project and the one that it fails to engage the audience? And what skills are key for gamification experts? And what are the top three projects and practices in your industry now? Thank you very much. Uh, that's a great uh, panel. And thanks for everyone for who attended already. And it will be a great honor to share uh, my gamification knowledge about educational technologies. Um, we always think about in educational technologies, actually, um, people who likes to be gamify is coming to be a children. Uh, but uh, the gamify educational process going to be norm. You know, um, I'm from Turkey. I'm actually half time. A game design lecturer in Bahçeşehir University, and then also I'm a proud of the uh, Game Fed Turkey International Gamification Federation uh, representative uh, of Turkey. And today I am going to share my knowledge uh, with you about game design and how that could be uh, affect our future of learning. Uh, that's a good quote from Plato. Uh, what plays makes us very transformation. Uh, and became a learning machine of ourselves, actually. It's called, if you play one hour with someone, you better know him from a year of talking. Think about your friends, think about your kids. You know, when they, in the flow zone, actually, they became actually more learning experience. So start with the, what games are doing to us. Let, let me show you some game design techniques. It's not going to be too much uh, theories, don't scare about it. Yes, I'm a lecturer guy, but um, let's start with the game thinking. Uh, game thinking about gamification and serious game and playful design and games. Actually, if you think about educational purpose, you always try to be focused on gamification and serious game part. And uh, we separate them, my friends, about if you focus on playing time in a purpose like simulation, we call that serious game. You can see from flight simulators, especially the armies and uh, many uh, marketing uh, simulations or virtual reality and augmented reality simulations. They are all not gamification, actually. They are serious games, games with the purpose of serious. But gamification is continue with the behavior, like employee of the month or a great star of the sales kind of status and behaviors following up. So these are all games, but with the purpose, we call that. So how we can understand that the future and uh, learning uh, is best for our, our audience? We start to think about persona and we start to think about their motivational kotos. Um, these are very popular user type tests in game domain. So games are designing with these skills. For example, if you try to be motivate and doing a game for a philanthropist kind of people, you have to be answer this question in your game. How can I help the others? How can I share with the others? How can I like doing ourselves right now, doing a showing our skills to others? Uh, so not every game are competitive. Sometimes it could be corporation. Uh, so what games are motivate us like they can divide us to this kind of user types, include achiever, include free speed, include player, you know, just doing for points and badges or social games. So it's like a food, actually. It's like a, a car, you know. You choose, your, you have your own style in your game. That's the reason why one game is very fun for one people or one game is not fun for other people. So this is a, a very academical a user type test. If you know about that, when we are trying to be design a game, we try to understand the target audience and target audience motivation is related with this game elements. We call game elements like a physical rewards or social networks or goods or avatar or collect this kind of game elements always try to be motivate us what we are. So as you can see, 
when you think about gamification and try to be gamified, you should put people in the first. Try to be understand their psychology background. And this is an American guy, a very popular in the gamification area, actually. Gabe Zickerman called, uh, I think gamification is probably more like 75 percentage of psychology. Try to understand the target audience psychologies, why they are playing, how can they motivate helping or competing or cooperation, challenging. The rest of them is technology, like development and uh, a mobile app or website or other things. So today, actually, I'm going to share with uh, you uh, how we design a good game for the purpose. It's called gamification and it's we say it's a player journey. So we always think about player journey first. How the game start with easily, how became it's like uh, angry, you know, you make you angry. So we call that is a player journey. You can see some people in here. Um, we always think about, we are feeling very happy about why we are playing actually games, which is not in game domain. We always shock you. We always make you think about it, or make you angry about it, make you very insist about it. You know, this is the secret source of games, my friends. We are not just always positive psychology. Sometimes we are always try to push your limits. Then if you win the games, you will be very, very happy and enjoy. Right after that, when you leave this shock moment and think about it and make a challenge and then you achieve a success in this scenario, then you motivate more than that. This is the uh, eight core drive. This is very important, actually. At the bottom, you can see what the games are doing us, scarcity, avoidance, and unpredictability. This is the three common things that actually, not only positive things like target, accomplishment, reward, creativity, also need to support with the scarcity, with the avoidance and with the unpredictability, shock you and surprise you. So in this journey, we are always push people to about this emotion, my friend, not only the psychology things. You, if you do this, if you don't do this, you will lose this. The games are domain like this, positive and negative. Um, and it's always start with the discovery part. Think about the FIFA game, you know, you choose the teams and you just try to be shoot with this player. And even you can think about a buying a car, a buying a house. You always start with the discovery. What is the car for me? Who else that? Let's try to drive a little. Then we have an onboarding part. This is very important. Small success journeys. This is a game design techniques, my friend. This is easy to hard things. Then habit building, hard things, you know, do it three days straight or uh, make it faster, make it bigger, collect everything. This kind of long-term targets coming at th three phases and less phases, you have a status, build a team and doing, helping the, each other. We call mastery. This is the player journey. This is the secret source of game design and we use it in the gamification. I'm going to show a small example uh, from actually an uh, insurance company from Japan, Sompa Japan insurance company. Uh, I helped them to create their gamify CRM portal actually, which is, which has very good uh, player journey. Masters of claims, it start with them. Probably you heard about Dragon Boat them, and we put the design to first wireframes. We put every team in a one Dragon Boat team. Also we draw this too. As you can see, this dragon boat not continue. This is a gamify screen feeding from the KPIs, feeding from the files, feeding from the complaint of the customers. Okay, it's game, but continue with the real target, real life objectives. We call KPI. You can put one KPI, three KPI, team KPI, personal KPI. Then we make it design of with the good game design techniques, include this progress bar, avatars. These are game design techniques. We support this business techniques. This is not for kids. Uh, gamification is popular right now with Duolingo, Khan Academy, but let me give you a secret sauce, my friends. In 2025 with the metaverse, we are all gamified in the sales, in the educational, in every experience going to be gamified. It's not for kids. It's for human. 
we love games we love these screens and you start with the team and when you go to the target target is the island you can choose your title and you can choose who go to first they can take their reward like in turkish kral kral mean kingdom you know we love to be like this kind of uh, rewards so i am going to share um, at my last slide actually very popular woman game designer um, games and gamification going to fix our educational uh, process a missing part which is try to understand the target audience and our students and our attendees our customers employees motivational target so if you don't put this as you can see jay mcconical in her ted talks she says if you not put playing motivation to the work you put people to depression the opposite of playing is, isn't work we need to play we need to keep motivate us to keep away from depression so please watch her ted talks and if you learn about more actually i design a gamification cards so you can download it's right now in turkish uh, but you, i have an english edition edition too uh, so it has got more than 50 game elements and more than 170 cards actually in there so it helps you to the game design and gamification design for the business purpose and that will be great for to start actually think about how we can gamify our future of education so that was great experience for me to share my knowledge uh, with this great conference thank you for uh, inviting me uh, my friends and keep in touch and see you soon thank you mr Yilmaz. thank you very much thank you very much that was a great presentation thank you so much uh, and yeah i totally agree that uh, games are uh, a very good way to keep people learning we we've talked about attention span earlier so i think game games are the, one of the best ways to keep the attention of the especially when it comes to like younger people etc okay thank you so much let's move on to our next speaker uh timur bergaliev ceo of electronics lab um yeah please so mr bergaliev uh, it feels like your company is the embodiment of all curious uh, mind streams uh, i can believe that the vr labs and diy kits for studying the basics of neurotech are now a reality so digital inclusion still remains out of reach over a billion people globally though through your work how do you plan to make tech accessible to those who are usually left behind and where to next please thank you very much for introducing me uh, before i will go further let me please uh, say a few words about the problem we are uh, focusing on and uh, first of all i want to say is that my presentation today will be absolutely in line with speakers uh, before me and after me uh, i believe and um, um, how we will react if i will tell you that in 2030 we can face most probably an apocalypse and actually it's not just a figure of speech because there is no one able to maintain deep tech processes and um, we see it for today uh, very um, interesting uh, tendention uh, if we will not take an action of course what i'm talking about uh, for example if we will uh, understand if we will uh, go through the um, uh, for example um, states of unified state exams uh, on physics or natural sciences we can see that there is a huge amount decrease among students of who are choosing physics but not only physics but also natural science and of course for me and uh, i suppose that for all of us it's clear that physics and natural sciences today is uh, fundamental and crucial for modern deep tech and um, we see that um, based on uh, different kind of estimations uh, up to 2026 we will need approximately 2 million engineers and speaking about the engineers i'm telling about electricity uh, energy uh, nuclear medical engineers and so on um, we've discussed a lot of uh, about this problem and uh, one of the factor that plays a huge role is that schools today are losing uh, the cast road competition and the cast road race for attention among students and it's very important that um, we have to create tools that will attract and involve uh, students uh, in that point i completely agree with speakers before and after me and um, uh, the most important part here we've done a huge analysis uh, we um, gained uh, very 
impactful, I think, the teacher insights uh, that can be divided in the two main two blocks. The first one, they feel uncertainty about the market prospects and uh, um, market demand um, of uh, physics graduates. Uh, so they don't understand what for they are explaining and what for they are teaching physics and natural science. And the second point is that it's too abstract and hard to explain to uh, modern students. The key word here is modern. And uh, it's very important that um, we, with our partners, uh, for the last seven years, we've done a huge uh, research. We've tried different kinds of approach, instruments, different kinds of uh, methods, uh, what to do with that. And we found the solution. Uh, let me please uh, present the new age educational platform. Uh, we call it Synquoia. And uh, it, uh, works, it works on a concept, Internet of Educational Things. It means, actually, that we can combine all of, all of our equipment, all of our uh, new age uh, um, interaction educational models, um, personal and uh, uh, team tracks, um, IE based and IE boosted, and also uh, a lot of other things. Here are some examples how it can be work. For example, uh, we can combine science concepts, theoretical science concepts with integrated VR tools and programming tools. I think it's clear how it works. And we will gain uh, a new uh, age and uh, new quality uh, educational outputs. The second is, for example, uh, when we are focused on physiology, also we can integrate it, of course, we are in different kind of interactive pictures, but also we can uh, integrate it here as a work with different kind of sensors and the analysis tools for interpretation. And this is also gives us a new uh, line and a new uh, target on um, increasing the quality of educational outputs. And um, another uh, example how it can be used, for example, you have a, a very complex agricultural uh, laboratory, for example, in Dubai, and the students from all over the world can take part in the, for example, new age educational events or maybe technological competition, uh, just interacting with this laboratory using the platform. They can gather data, they can analyze it, they can, uh, then can, uh, they can make their own uh, solutions, conclusions, and uh, the finally work on uh, own project. That's very important. Uh, of course, and I'm talking about, um, of course, here it's very important to talk about the uh, data driven solutions, the data driven solution um, decision making. Uh, but um, here also uh, should be included uh, standard functionality of learning, learning management systems. And um, for example, if we're talking about the Rosatom case, there is uh, 23 cities of Rosatom, more than 200 schools, and uh, more than uh, 100,000 students uh, per moment. And it's very interesting how it can be implemented, uh, working, uh, let this huge network, educational network work and target, and realize the clear data-driven approach, uh, focusing on sp special subject field. Um, one of the um, effective cases that we have gained, uh, this is a case of implementing the new subject field of neurotechnologies and the human machine interaction in the educational system. Uh, from, uh, one point of, from one point of view, it's very hard, but from the other point of view, it's very well effectful for uh, students. And this is a way how we can involve it uh, of students to teach uh, biology, physics, and so on. Uh, our team consists of a lot of bright and stellar specialists in team. Uh, they are PhDs in physics, math, and biology informatics. And to sum up, I want just to say that a few things uh, finally. Um, we believe that platforms like this should be plug and play, that uh, this solution should be platform based because it's easy to involve a new educational organizations and new students. And uh, it should be uh, worked on the concept of Internet of Educational Things, again, that combines uh, together and mixing together content, tools, equipment, teams, uh, uh, in order to scale uh, and uh, gain very quality uh, educational outputs. Thank you for your attention. If you will interested in it, just message me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Timur. Uh, oh, that was very, actually, punctual, <laughs> very time efficient. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I think many people will be interested in this project, and me personally, I believe in that, so keep doing it. And let's move to our next speaker, um, Raman Talwar. CEO and founding director of Simulanis. Uh, Mr. Talwar, uh, we are so pleased to greet you today in Global Impact Conference. 
And needless to say that we are very excited about learning uh, more about your project, Simulanis. Uh, it is a multi-award winning XR company that has created some of the most engaging interactive and immersive AR VR applications. Some of the most fascinating and impactful projects in your portfolio are the fire safety simulators and XR safety training modules. Please tell us more about them and share your take on the way the XR field will develop in the upcoming year. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> So very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Raman Talwar. I'm the CEO at Similanis. We at Similanis are creating an impact in the skill developer ecosystem by building the world's largest XR powered skilling metaverse. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, thank everyone to invite me over to this, uh, to this great stage. And I'm, it's, it's a real honor for me to represent India on, at this stage currently. And it was an absolute privilege to be a part of the panel with some esteemed guests on it. Uh, so starting with my presentation today, I'll talk more about, uh, you know, the pressures which the industrial markets are facing. Um, our theme of building extended reality technologies uh, centers around how we can actually enable workers to get trained better because we believe that the skills gap is one issue which is, which is growing not only uh, in India, of course, but of course uh, around the globe. Uh, the processes and products are increasing, uh, the complexity is increasing, and the customer demands are also evolving as we go along. Uh, there are about 75% of the workers are frontline and they demand attention today. Uh, they do not have enough tools and technologies to actually get trained in a better manner. And the productivity is also a major challenge. So the challenges which are faced by uh, the, the workers on the shop floors, and this is something which of course is a universal challenge. It is not only with the workers, but it is a challenge which students also face um, in terms of learning. And that is the fact that everybody gets access to paper paper-based SOPs on when they're on the shop floor. Um, and that becomes a major challenge for, for, for people to understand and retain knowledge for, for longer. It's also very difficult to free up machines for training and equipment for training. That is one of the biggest challenges why hands-on learning is a big challenge. And more importantly, it also becomes a major challenge to transfer the knowledge and share it. The tasks, the tasks are also fairly dangerous in nature, though that means is that most of the shop floor activities are very much uh, you know, dangerous and they pose a risk to human life. As a consequence, what happens at the worker level is that they are not able to fulfill their, fulfill their potential uh, because they lack hands-on experience and as a result, they are not engaged enough and it leads to productivity losses. They also struggle to learn new skills. When you talk about the enterprises, they lose a lot of money due to the downtime and a lot of uh, deaths happen and accidents happen on sites, which of course can be avoided. And there's, a, there's an acute skill shortage uh, across the globe and in India, of course, and that's something which we are solving as a problem. And this is how we are actually building our entire stack of XR technologies. Uh, we've got our XR learning suite, uh, which is complemented by 4D simulators, which leverage extended reality technology in a very effective manner. We've got our assess assessment suite, which actually assesses and measures the performance of learners as they go along. And that is the, the, the USP of what we have built. Along with, along with the metaverse suite, which actually enables uh, multiple users to come together and then perform the learning. So we are on a mission to actually uh, empower individuals to safely enhance their skills and drive organizations to increase operational efficiency by leveraging cutting edge XR technologies. We are working in uh, hazardous manufacturing based industries because we believe that is a big pain point which we're trying to address by our solution. As a company, we are one of the most experienced ones worldwide. Uh, we have uh, developed a lot of systems, a lot of modules, a lot of content uh, using AR and VR technologies. And we have observed uh, more than 600 site operations, which has given us a lot of confidence to deliver value to workers. We have trained close to 12,000 workers, and we have done more than 200 plus deployments of extended reality across shop floors. We work with the, some of the top names across in the industries, and, and this is uh, uh, the fact here is uh, that most of the companies have started their XR journey with us, and that is something which we are really proud about. We are also one of the most credible companies across in India right now, having won the national award from the Ministry of Skill Development in 2017. So talking more about the product itself, so the product, it's, it's, a, it's essentially a platform which allows enterprises to be onboarded, where a learning path can be chosen, the content is distributed, and uh, the students or the workers get access to the content on the platform itself which is followed by an analytic report, which actually gets delivered 
to the to the users and workers at the same time in terms of our solution the clear usp is the fact that it is applicable and available across all device platforms which makes it truly xr what what basically that means is you have, you can access the content on a desktop or online or on a vr headset or on a mobile platform and the content the actual uh, learning is attained across all device platforms then comes our simulator suite which is some one of our most innovative offerings which basically means that we are able to convert any physical tool into a virtual reality based equipment for example here you see that there is a painting shop which has been recreated uh, we actually create uh, we we fit in sensor, sensors and trackers on real world equipment which could actually be then brought into vr where uh, where you can learn the skills and practice them endlessly before you get perfect at it so this is on the painting side then we've got our fire safety simulator this is one of our flagship products which actually allows learners to practice uh, dangerous tasks like handling a fire by actually holding a real fire extinguisher and then learning their technologies and learning the, the way the, the fire has to be dealt with in real life the obvious benefit and the sustainable impact of these products is the fact that you do not have to consume real resources to deliver the training on such dangerous topics similarly we've got uh, technologies which deliver uh, the learning on the welding technologies techniques and this is something which is one of the most used uh, uh, kind of uh, technology in industry right now similarly on the driving front a lot of uh, equipment a lot of uh, use cases require people to understand and know what driving how to drive in certain situations and this is how we deliver that through our xr suite we've got a very interesting and innovative delivery mechanism as well where we deliver everything using a station approach and which comes with a, with a lot of uh, innovative uh, material uh, as well as technologies uh, where you can see haptic helmet and a virtual reality haptic glove as being part of the offering as well and finally of course uh, just to uh, complete the lineup uh, the analytics suite of what we build allows us to measure the effectiveness of learning of what we deliver this is an iterative approach which tells us in, that in how many iterations the worker is actually getting trained every movement of the worker is tracked personality profiling is tracked so we track the gaze of the user and we are able to deliver this this knowledge and this uh, this information across in a three tiered dashboard we are able to measure the effectiveness of how the workers are, tra are getting trained and this is the usp again of what we have delivered and finally wrapping it up because metaverse is a buzzword these days of course and uh, it's all about collaboratively bringing together people and we've created this entire concept of the virtual learning factory or the vlf which allows us to to deliver this learning to to multiple users at the same time and make sure that they are collaborating in the same environment so the impact is very clear for what we have done we have actually in, in, ensured reduction in training time uh, we have reduced safety violations we have reduced the errors which people commit uh, we have reduced carbon footprint for enterprises we have helped them to uh, get a lot of cost benefits and most importantly we've helped them to ensure that their workforce is more reliable all of this work all of these data points have validated by third party auditors and it has also made into a case study at india's most prestigious management institutions so the in 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 terms of pictures of how the change happens you can clearly see um, earlier of course uh, and this is the conventional way it's a show and tell methodology which is practiced on plants but using our solution now people are able to uh, to learn in a more immersive in a manner using vr headsets uh, it's very difficult to of course make sure everybody is attentive in a, in a class but with our analytics suite everybody is on their toes when they learn within the vr environment and that's the real advantage plus the obvious advantage which you get is the time advantage we are actually saving time on the shop floors by training people quicker and they are able to do their tasks in a quicker manner which eventually leads to better efficiency of workforce reduces the operational costs and that is the ultimate advantage of what we are doing so we are backed by a young team uh, which is super skilled and all of our success uh, goes to them and uh, overall we've done sort of some great work i'll be very happy to of course share more offline and that brings to an uh, end, end to our presentation happy to take questions thanks thank you mr talwar thank you for your presentation uh, uh perfect let's move on to our uh, last speaker uh magjan kista kista obayev r and d director stem academia so the pandemic without a doubt uh changed the educational landscape significantly what other factors inspired you to develop the edtech uh, field in kazakhstan please tell us more about your recent project nurlab the vr and ar laboratory opened in one of the city's lyceums 
Uh, and what is the role of EdTech in revolutionizing school education? And why do you think schools should be focus area uh, and the starting point for EdTech innovation? Thanks, thanks. Thank you all for coming and joining today. Each a point of your question, I think, should be discussed separately, but I'll try to answer them during my presentation. And uh, before we jump deeply into the discussion, I'd like to start maybe with discussion with the uh, people who are participating, how things are changing and how things are not changing. Because today we are discussing how education should be transformed. And uh, before going deeply into that topic, let's consider how culture of the breakfast changed throughout these 50 years. 50 years ago, it was okay to have that amount of bread or gluten on the table. Nowadays, you would prefer something like a freshly made orange juice, some antioxidants, some fresh vegetables and so forth, right? So obviously, how people start their day is changed. Now talking about computers, gadgets and so forth, with the development of transistors, we made a huge progress in bringing those technology from labs into our hands. And similarly, not only to our hands, but also any type of industry, whether it's for entertaining, for rocket science or for whatsoever. Talking about medicine, it's a different topic at all, how drug industry changed, how uh, instruments of um, gaining and diagnosing different type of disease also changed. And uh, a request for the cars, car safety, uh, their durability and so forth. Now talking back to the education, if we see at these two pictures, yeah, we see that the picture is colorful, right? Then on the left. And, uh, but if we turn that off, obviously we're seeing that, I'm of course generalizing, but nevertheless, the methods of how knowledge is transferred is the same as it was just like 30 years ago. And that is unfortunate situation because now kids, they require more. Now people, when they are training and whether it's a corporate sector or whether it's a medical field, whether it's a general school, people require more. Why? Because everything is available on the internet. If you, if you ask anything like a half-life of uranium or Bernoulli's law, it's not necessary to know it by heart, but you can Google it anytime and kids know it. So they don't have a motivation to learn it, to uh, seek for the answer and so forth. So what we do here, usually we're trying to solve with implementing different type of technology, including VR, including interactive flat panels, including different type of games and so forth. But it's really important at this point to realize that it is the teacher who is actually should be the changing person in the classroom because he or she needs to change how knowledge is delivered. It's not about placing the knowledge into kids' head, but rather facilitate. So what I mean by facilitating is not just asking, do you know the Bernoulli's law? No, it's more about uh, discussing questions, discussing questions like, oh, by the way, let me discuss it with you. Do you know why when we do the air coming from a mouse is hot, and when I do it's cold. Body temperature is 36.6 degrees Celsius, but for some reason I'm changing the air's temperature coming from out of my mouth. It's all about the cross-section area of my lips, which is now I can open the, open the topics about Bernoulli's law. Or uh, there are lots of these type of uh, questions to discuss. But you see, if I were teaching the physics, I'd be starting from like these questions. I'm trying to facilitate kids to think about it, not about using this type of technology. And uh, we need to understand that this is needed technology to replace the blackboards with uh, the interactive tools. But without right software, they're just piece of electronics, just like old Nokia. Why iPhone is so expensive? It because I have my bank account there, I have WhatsApp and so forth. It's the application that ensures the value of the hardware inside the classroom. Without that, it's just pointless. But of course, to this statement, I didn't uh, kind of know this statement four years ago. Now coming back to your question, when we were bringing cool, wow technologies to Kazakhstan that extended reality laptops, immersive educational environments. We've been showing it to the kids, even the prime minister, minister of education, mayor of Astana, uh, daughter of pre first president, everyone saw this technology and were, had that wow effect. It was cool, but after two weeks or two months, uh, 
teachers were not able to use it because there was no value in terms of teaching. They didn't find required material to teach biology. They didn't find required material to deliver physics in the level that they want. Yes, they could dissect the heart, they could see the molecule, but biology is not only about dissection, it's, more, it's also about differentiating the topic. It's also about uh, interacting with kids and so forth. So, we were seeking for the right answer, and unfortunately, at that time, we couldn't find the solution that would satisfy our need to bring kids into that interactive and immersive world. That's why we decided to develop our own software, which is called the Rocket Science. Uh, it's a huge software which contains lots of content in biology, chemistry, and physics, and uh, has way great potential, rather than showing uh, stationary pictures or rather than just uh, standing still and assigning different assessment to kids. Here we digitalized completely whole uh, high and middle school content. Teachers are able to use it, whether on their smartphones, whether on the uh, IFPs or whatsoever, uh, device-free uh, software, which can be installed. And the most important part here, it's not the content only. It also, what can teacher do with that content? Functionality plays a key role in this matter. Filtration, I need to be able to find exactly what I'm looking for because dissecting is one thing or playing with 3D model is one thing, but when I'm explaining electric current, it's a different story. When I'm explaining uh, Kirchhoff's second law or maybe how electron changes its path in the magnetic field, since it's a process, and it's not, you cannot visualize it in the classroom. Meanwhile, here in this type of technologies, you're able to powerful, uh, to deliver your information in the way that kids are able to digest. And that's actually very important when playing. And um, functionality plays key, a key factor here. And we try to make it as interactive as it could be inside the classroom where teacher can dissect the molecule, uh, understand the organic and explain non-organic chemistry, see uh, all organs of a human body, not only human body, from the inside and uh, play with different type of electronics in physics. So besides that, there is also demonstrational labs because we understand that in most of the CIS countries, there is a problem with the lab equipment and not, on, not all schools have that. So that's why I developed specifically virtual demonstrational lab tools to demonstrate the phenomena for that. And as I mentioned before, it works on all of the devices, whether it's a micro, uh, HoloLenses, not HoloLens, with Oculus or uh, interactive flat panels or smartphones and so on. So at this point, we, uh, delivered this content to 1,200 kids all around the world. Uh, more than 30 countries implemented, including Russia. Just this year, uh, with uh, Prasvishenia, we delivered this content for 30 uh, pedagogical universities in Russia and also trained more than 4,000 teachers around the world. But this is not the only way of using the application in the kit uh, for the school because instead of, for example, dissecting the bi uh, biological parts of a human body, we thought, why not to use this approach to train people in industry? And that's how another application were developed. Instead of dissecting the lungs, now we're able to train people inside their training center without sending them to the repair site or anywhere abroad to service different type of techniques, machinery, oil and gas sector, uh, mining, and so forth. So there are way uh, different uh, implementation cases uh, with Hitachi, with Evra Evrasian Resource Group, with Evras, and particularly talking about Russia, we've been working with Lakatech for three years and saved them 1 million and 400,000 uh, USD dollars per year in training. And not only that approach, we could also apply this to medicine because in medical field, you, visual tools are also very important because students need to see uh, different outcomes and are able to have access to all these internal libraries that they're going in the universities without leaving their classroom as well, without going to the um, uh, medical institutions and so forth. And we developed a virtual clinic where we teach uh, how uh, were, were they able to work with virtual patients and uh, simulate different environment and assigning treatment and uh, 
eventually treat their patients. And this also project has been very popular around the world, which actually led us now to work in more than 23 countries worldwide, including Australia, South Africa, Mexico, Colombia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Lithuania, Estonia, Turkey, UAE, and so forth. So we see that kids, not only in CIS or Kazakhstan, looking for the interactive approach, but all around the world. And that's why it is really important to take that step and deliver the right instruments for the teachers so they can turn from that image into another. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Kistabov. Um, that's very great, and I'm very happy that you are very passionate about it because it infects other people as well. So <laughs> thank you for your contribution. Uh, so we have two, a little bit more than two minutes left. So I'm not sure if it's a good idea to open the floor for for questions. What do you think? Maybe one question. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. Yep. Um, Hello, uh, okay, I am Kayatir. I am representing the Russian Nuclear Education Ambassadors. And I have a question specifically for Dr. Shamsi. And also, I remember there is uh, one more person in this uh, round table that was representing AR and VR education. I think it was Mr. Tauva, but please apologies if I butchered your name. Uh, my question is regarding the online education, because I really like the presentations and the topics about this, but uh, one thing that struck me was that during COVID, one thing we haven't covered here is the fact that cheating in exams has massively increased. Uh, for example, University of Ohio has reported over 50% increase in cheating. And cheating is not only a problem for university students, it's also a problem for universities themselves, because if students of universities get worse results in future, university rankings will fall, which is a problem for the university itself. So my question is, how can we make sure that if we transfer to online environment, be it hybrid, uh, online or metaverse, how can we make sure that cheating won't become even bigger problem than it currently is? That's an excellent question. Well, um, education is two things. Delivering instructions and assessment. Now, we deliver instructions in a more of a modern way. And we have seen how simulations, uh, engagement, different pedagogy we talked about. It's becoming more and more effective. Yet, assessment has not improved. How do we deliver assessment? How do we exams? You have to have a piece of paper and to have to answer, select uh, multiple choice or write a paragraph or solve a problem. So the assessment method was not resolved. That's why during COVID-19, yes, maybe 50% even more in my institutions, we have cheating cases. And dealing with the Generation Z, they are so smart in hacking the system. We put, we put the most clever system you can think of. If a student changes his eye movement, it will catch him that he's cheating. If students cannot go back in the browser, it's catching him in the cheating. But we found the students, they have access through routers into the, during the exam from online where somebody else is uh, doing their exams. I'll give you a very good example, maybe if you allow me just for 30 seconds. We opened a black market for cheating during uh, COVID-19. There was a black market Innocent, in China, students, as they sit in the exam, they take photo, they send it to China. China, they do a bidding, who do quickly an answer. They send money by, by PAL, send the answer. In 10 minutes, you get the answers. And students like doing all their, the exams online while they're doing the cheating. So there were so many different tricks and we were shocked. The reason is we have not changed the method of assessment. And that is need to be in line with the way we deliver instruction. So assessment becomes more embedded into the instruction. There's more need to be more interactive ways. It's not the traditional exams. And we have to be careful with that because the traditional exams based on memories. Students memorizing things more. So 
I think the answer to that is not how clever we as educators in trying to come up with different ways of exams. It will never work. We tried it so hard, it did not work. I think it's more important how do we become more clever about how do we carry out assessment that students comprehend instructions in a more interactive engagement way rather than the, the traditional method. Thank you so much for your answer. <clears throat> uh, okay, thank you so much for being here. I'm being told that we need to wrap up. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing this stage with me. It was an honor for me and I'm very happy. If you guys have any questions, I'm sure our speakers will be happy to answer your questions in an open area after the panel. So, uh, yeah, for now, thank you for, your, uh, for investing your time joining us. And we, are, we see that uh, our the future of our education is in safe hands. <laughs> so, so, yeah, thank you so much. And, yep, this is it. <laughs>